our great God, holy, majestic, awesome, just, good, beautiful, powerful. We thank you that you have made a way that people like us could endure the firing, blazing glory of your presence and enjoy it rather than be incinerated by it. And this is your grace, your kindness. God, you are everything, everything we could want, everything we could need. And you sent your son who is our anchor, our surety, our confidence, our only hope. While everything else is shifting sands, your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is our rock. It is in him that we trust. We ask this morning that by your Holy Spirit, we would hear from you in your word. Would you give us grace that we might know your mind and your thoughts and embrace your unbelievably good news. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. We're continuing our study of Paul's letter to the church at Rome. And this morning, I want to ask you this question. It is the title of the message this morning. What will you do with the greatest offer of all time? And you've heard the pitch. You've heard the salesmanship of the infomercial. This offer is too good to pass up. And what's more, you get not one, but two. Wait, no, four. If you order now, do you remember the Jinsu knife? Anybody still have one of those? If you order now, you get the matching carving fork, personal six-in-one kitchen tool, six steak knives, and a precision spiral slicer, all for the low, low price of $9.95. If you order now, you get a 50-year warranty. Of course, the address for the Jinsu Knife Company uh, is now the address of another business. I'm not sure if you've tried to cash in that warranty lately. You may have passed up on the Jinsu Knife offer, but what about the greatest offer of all time? The offer of the gospel. The offer of the gospel of God through Jesus Christ that you just heard preached by Josh. The offer of the gospel from God through Jesus Christ that we just sang. The offer of the good news, the gospel of God through Jesus Christ where you trade in your trash that you can't keep anyway for infinite riches that you could never lose. What will you do with that offer? This morning we're going to look at three truths about salvation through faith. Three truths about this great offer in the gospel that comes through faith alone. And we're going to see that God freely offers salvation to sinners. We're also going to see that God uses means to save sinners. And finally, we'll look at our own responsibility to respond in faith. God freely offers salvation in the gospel. God uses means to bring about salvation of sinners. And you, friends, are responsible to believe. We've been in a section of Scripture that has highlighted the sovereignty of God in salvation. The Apostle Paul has detailed for us the doctrines of election and predestination and, and the God side of the equation of salvation. We come here to the end of chapter 10, and we're discovering the human side. The human responsibility in salvation, in believing, and as we'll see this morning, in heralding the gospel. We need to look, first of all, at our text. Read with me in Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 11, and we'll read through verse 17. Paul writes, God speaking through the apostle Paul, for the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? 
And how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how then will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. We're going to look first in verses 11 to 13 at this phenomenal truth. God freely offers salvation to sinners. This is just a staggering reality. The God of the universe, the creator of all things, the one in whom there is no error, no flaw, no sin, is willing to justify the ungodly, Romans 4, 5. To, to vindicate or declare righteous those who are not righteous. To actually make a statement in the courtroom of heaven about sinners that they've always done everything right and never done anything wrong so that they can be qualified to stand in his presence blameless with great joy, that they can enjoy the outshining radiance of the brilliance of his glory and not be incinerated by it, but rather delight in it. What a staggering thing that, that this holy God would offer unholy creatures as ourselves eternal life, joy in him. The four at the beginning of verse 11 gives us a connection to what has gone before. And Paul is explaining here that the surety of our salvation, the surety of salvation is for all those who abandon self and trust Christ. That's what we looked at last week. And those who abandon the sinking ship of self-aggrandizement, self-rulership or self-righteousness, have a guarantee of salvation. You abandon you and you run to Christ and you will be saved. Listen, this is a warning against the impossible, that impossible task of establishing your own law righteousness, being good enough, working hard enough, being religious enough. This is the indictment against the Jews in Paul's day. It is a warning against that impossible task of, of trying to merit your way to heaven and the turning to a rock-solid assurance in verse 11. Faith righteousness, rather than law righteousness, secures salvation, verse 10, precisely because what is described for us in verses 11 to 13. I want you to notice, first of all, in these verses that God's offer is universal. God's offer is universal. Notice the words here. In verse 11, whoever believes, literally in the Greek text, it is all the believing ones. All the believing ones. In verse 12, there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. And there's not a third category. This encompasses all of humanity. For the same Lord is Lord of all. And he is abounding in riches for all who call on him. And in verse 13, whoever will call is literally all the ones who may call. Five times in the span of these three verses, all, no distinction, all, all of them. And Paul is emphasizing the universal offer of this amazing salvation in Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice that this offer is not just universal, it is also individual. It is individualized. It is personal. You see, it is not all humans that will believe. It is not all people that will call on him. But every single one who does call on him will absolutely, certainly be saved. And so this offer is individual. It comes to those reading Romans chapter 10. It comes to those who would have read this in Paul's day. It, it comes to two millennia of people who would have read this since. And it comes to every single one of us in this room this morning. The universal and individual offer of eternal life as a free gift through faith in the gospel. And God makes a promise in verse 11 to anyone who abandons that sinking ship of self-righteousness and self-rule and calls out to God for rescue. Look at it. Whoever believes in him, all the ones who believe in him will not be disappointed. 
A disappointment is something of an understatement here. It kind of sounds like a mild bummer. You know, I was disappointed that the Amazon Prime order that I ordered took a day and a half to arrive at my front door. That's not the disappointment we're talking about here. This is the disappointment, the grave and bitter disappointment that accompanies shame. In fact, every other English translation uses the words put to shame or ashamed. It speaks of grave dishonor or disgrace. And Paul here is quoting from Isaiah 28, 16. And there the prophet Isaiah says, Therefore, thus says Yahweh God, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. And he who believes in that cornerstone will never be ashamed, will never be put to shame. And the New American Standard in Isaiah 28, 16 says, we'll never be disturbed. This is a, a remarkable promise that after all the history of the Old Testament, with all the Old Testament characters who were failures of living up to the promised seed from Genesis 3, 15, who would come and take care of sin and crush the head of the snake and rescue humanity, that God and the prophet Isaiah is still making a promise about one who is to come and he calls him a cornerstone. And this chief cornerstone is a threat and a hope simultaneously. According to Isaiah, that chief cornerstone would crush and dismantle all those who oppose him, but would be the hope and life and grace of God to all who believe in him. Paul appeals to that very text here and says that the one who believes in that cornerstone that God places will never be disturbed, never be dismayed. And the Hebrew word here for disturbed in Isaiah 28, 16 means literally to, to be, in, be in a hurry, to make haste. The idea is an inward state of frenzy in an attempt to flee from shame or trouble. And, and, and here's where we see Paul picking up this idea of shame. This is the disturbed state described here is the frenetic disposition of a traitor who is discovered. If you were a traitor to your country, if you were a spy and, and you were in what you had made of yourself enemy territory, and then you were exposed, caught, guilty, and now that shame of turning your back on your own countrymen, the, the shame of uh, turning against those you were supposed to be for is out in the open. And, and such a one is caught and, and his mind is racing. Is, is there a way out? Is, is there an escape for me? And no, there's no escape. And that frenetic disposition of the mind of the one trapped and exposed is what's described here. The one who places his faith in the cornerstone God provides will never be exposed, will never be caught as a traitor with a racing mind, disturbed, shamed. The corollary to this is that those who don't embrace the cornerstone will be shamed, will be disturbed. They will be disappointed with that grave, bitter disappointment of, oh man, my whole life was wrong. I built my life on myself and I have nothing now. It's the bitter disappointment of, of standing in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15, before that great white throne of God, the judge, when the books are opened and everything you've ever done is laid bare. Every motive of your heart, every thought you've ever had, every word you said under your breath, and every activity, all written down, all seen by heaven, and now exposed for all to see. When those books are opened and, and the names are read and Everyone's name who was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. That is the bitterness of the disappointment and shame that is described here. And if you subscribed to the law righteousness that Paul says is a disaster waiting to happen in Romans 10, then the only thing you can expect is the shame of exposure that all of it was a sham, all of it was trash. Trash 
And everything you thought you had merited for yourself in this life, every way that you had thought you were better than the other guy, every way that you thought your good deeds might outweigh your bad deeds, is shown to be empty, vain. What a tragedy. To be put to shame on that day will be to be ashamed of your behavior, to be ashamed of your rejection of the greatest offer of all time, to be ashamed of your hope in the trash that you thought you could offer to God. The shamed state is the state of the one who has ruled his own life, trusted in his own resources on the day when the abject foolishness of it all is laid bare. Listen to the remarkable promise of God here. If you abandon self and you trust Christ, you will never be put to shame. You will never be exposed to that shame for there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those who belong to him and possess a faith righteousness have a righteousness credited to their account that is not their own but is given as a free gift that can never bring about shame. The word believes here in this verse is a, a present participle. If you care about grammar, it just means there is a continual, enduring aspect to this belief. Paul is not describing here some one-time good feelings about Jesus that you had at camp a long time ago. He's not describing some mental assent to the facts of the gospel. He is describing an ongoing, enduring trust in Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 12. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek. No difference. The, the path open to Jews is the path open to Gentiles. And most of us in this room would rejoice. Yes, thank you, God, that you opened this path to Gentiles. And, and there's no distinction. The last time we saw there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile, it was in Romans 3. There's no distinction. Why? Because all have sinned. That was bad news. Here's great news. There's no distinction. The same pathway is open to Jew and to Gentile. The Gentiles can rejoice in the Jewish Messiah providing righteousness even for us. And you hear Paul's heart here. He is the apostle to the Gentiles. And he is a Jew who loves his countrymen. And this mixed emotion in Paul is going to come out again and again in these passages. This is a warning and a consolation for Paul's countrymen, for the Jews. It's a warning against that law righteousness to which they subscribed. A Jew who trusted in his Jewishness or a Jew who trusted in his own works is in big trouble. He will be put to shame. And that's contrary to the thought, hey, I'm a Jew, I'm in. No, what awaits for you is judgment because of who you are and what you've done. But it is also hope for any Jew who calls on Messiah. You know, there's no special privileges to Jews for obtaining righteousness that is required to get to heaven. The same method applies to Jews and Gentiles. And this is a humbling reality, but it is a glorious reality for those who have come to the end of themselves. It's always humbling for any human to be put on the same merit level as another human that you look down on, isn't it? To think of yourselves in the same category as all other humans, the lowest, the least, the worst. You really can't get into heaven until you discover that you are actually as hopeless before God as the worst of offenders who have ever lived. You cannot get into heaven until you recognize that you are the problem. That the only hope is a righteousness outside of you. And it's only available by faith in Christ. And the universal nature of God's offer in the gospel is grounded in the universal lordship of Christ. Look at verse 12. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. Why? For the same Lord is Lord of all. Jesus is not a regional deity. As if the Hindus get their gods and the Muslims get their god and uh, other people get their gods. And, and our god happens to be Jesus because we know he's American. No. <laughs> Jesus is Lord. He's Lord of the universe. And he's Lord of every human being who has ever lived on the face of the earth of all time. 
And the reason there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile, between any demographic, between any population, between men and women, boys and girls, any class, any society, any language, is because Jesus is Lord of all. And as Lord of all, he is judge of all, and he is also the one who offers salvation to all. And listen, I know sometimes we hear salvation and the offer of salvation put this way. Will you accept Jesus as Lord? Listen, there's no accepting Jesus as Lord. He is Lord. He is the Lord. And there's no getting around that. There's a day coming where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. You, all of you that hear my voice right now will say Jesus is Lord. And my prayer is that you won't say it by compulsion on the day when it's too late but you say it out of love and worship and faith here while God still gives you breath. A better way to maybe think about salvation is the hopeless sinner on the doorstep of faith is really asking, Lord Jesus, would you accept me? That's really the question. How does a sinner stand acceptable before a holy God and God still maintain his reputation? That's the question. The answer is unequivocally, yes, God will accept any sinner who comes to him through faith in his son. Yes. Notice verse 12. There's no distinction for Jesus is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. Every single one. Listen, you cannot call on the Lord Jesus Christ in faith in what he has done for you at the cross and be rejected. It can't happen. You reach out to him when you know that you are the problem and you don't have the resources to solve it. You cry out to him and you will be saved. Make no mistake. God answers the prayer of the sinner at the end of himself, calling out in faith looking for hope and help in the only place it could be found, the Lord Jesus Christ. Cry out to him. For the Jew, for the Gentile, for the European, for the Papua New Guinean, for all who call on him, no one is rejected. And notice how verse 12 ends. He is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. Paul uses this word riches uh, to describe in, in, in sort of monetary terms the unbelievable wealth of what it means to be saved, to know him. Jesus defined eternal life in John 17, 3. Eternal life is knowing him. Paul says in Philippians 3, everything you could think of is trash compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Surrender everything to get him. Jesus is the pearl of great price that you would sell everything to go get, the treasure hidden in a field that you would barter everything away for just to have. The fool is the one who tries to get everything he can get here only to lose it. Give it all away and get Christ because he abounds in riches to all who call on him. And you can look at Romans 2, 4, 9.23, 11.33, for Paul's use of this word riches to describe salvation. Now look at verse 13. For another explanation, these telescoping explanations. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And Paul appeals to Joel 2.32. Again, this remarkable guarantee universalized, and, and Paul adds a word to the Hebrew text of Joel 2.32. He adds the word all. It's kind of like reading, all whoever will call. All of the ones, who, whoever it is will call. And, and Paul magnifies this universal offer of the gospel and appeals to Joel 2.32. By the way, I mentioned this last week. Joel 2.32 uh, makes reference to Yahweh. All who will call on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. It's clear in this text, Paul is appealing to Jesus. It very often happens in the New Testament that something ascribed of Yahweh in the old is ascribed to Jesus in the new. The New Testament is not shy at all about proclaiming the deity of Jesus Christ, that he is in fact Yahweh in the flesh. By the way, this is also a prayer to Jesus. Jesus. 
Um, invoking the Lord, calling on the name of the Lord throughout Scripture is used to invoke the Lord in prayer. And here, we're encouraged to call on Jesus in prayer, another indication of his deity. By the way, the corollary to this, if you don't call on Jesus, you will not be saved. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved, but all who don't will not. Now, I want to turn to Joel chapter 2. Because I want you to see the context that Paul is appealing to. You might have to use your table of contents. I'm about to. Joel, Joel chapter 2 is a description of Joel's vision of the future day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord in the Old Testament encompasses a lot of things, but fundamentally it is God's day, the Lord's day. Not speaking of Sundays, but the day when God will come and return to the earth and judge. When God himself will be vindicated. When all the world will see that he is the one true God and his ways are right. And that day is coming on the whole earth. And it has implications for Israel. It has implications for all the nations. I'll highlight just a few things here. In verse 12, yet even now, declares Yahweh, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments. Return to Yahweh, your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. This is a remarkable statement. God wants sinners to turn to him. Look down at verse 19. God makes a promise to Israel. I will never again make you a reproach among the nations. Israel has been a reproach among the nations, even currently in the 20th century and for the last 2,000 years and for the times of the Gentiles before that. In fact, Israel has been a reproach amongst the nations since the exile. And this is one of the indications that what we're looking at in Joel 2 is still yet future. Look down in verse 32. I will actually look at verse 30. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, columns of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of Yahweh comes. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of Yahweh will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape. What Joel is describing here in this section of the day of the Lord is, is the great tribulation period yet to come. What Jesus said would be the worst time period in all of human history on the face of the earth. The Old Testament calls it a time of the troubling of Jacob. That is the, the, the stirring up of the nation of Israel. Uh, bringing upon them tribulations and trouble and, and greater persecutions than they've yet known. Such that the heart's of the nation of Israel will turn to Yahweh. That day is coming. Paul is appealing to that very trouble and that very hope simultaneously in quoting Joel 2.32. And this universal appeal, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. In, in Joel's prophecy of the great tribulation, he is saying in that time period, whoever will call on Yahweh will be rescued rescued from the judge and the justice of the judge who has come to judge the earth. They're being rescued from the consequences of their own sin and unbelief and rebellion, if you will but call in faith on the Lord. Salvation is promised. In fact, if we unfold Joel's, Joel 2.32 as one sermon, we'd come up with a five-point sermon. Number one, salvation is promised. Number two, you can't save yourself. You must be saved. Number three, the Lord is the one doing the saving. You have to call on the Lord. Number four, the Lord actually saves those who call on him. And number five, that offer is for anyone who will call. Remarkable sermon there in Joel 2.32. And what Joel preached is that God will judge the whole earth when he has his day and he will save from his own justice anyone who calls on him in faith. Now the apostle Peter took up Joel's sermon in his sermon in Acts chapter 2. 
And it's a remarkable scene. This is the birth of the church. The Holy Spirit is poured out on his people, and everybody wants to know why are believers able to speak in languages they've never studied, and people from all kinds of countries able to understand? Are they drunk? No, this is the Holy Spirit at work. The same Holy Spirit who spoke of the things in Joel chapter 2. Remember Israel? Judgment is coming on the whole earth, and it will trouble you but you can call on the name of Yahweh and be saved. And Peter appeals to Joel 32 to speak to the very generation of Israel that murdered the Lord. Think about that. They just got done crucifying Messiah and Peter stands up and says, call on him and you can be saved. What a staggering offer of grace from God to offer salvation and eternal life to the very generation of Jews who murdered Messiah. Paul picks up this same message here in Romans chapter 10. With no distinction, he picks up the universal language of Joel 2 and adds the word all to it in his text and just wants us to make sure that any Jew, any Gentile listening to this message, listening to Joel 2.32, Call on the name of Jesus and be saved. Be saved from the consequences of your own sin. Be saved from the justice of the judge who comes. And listen, the sermon's not over. Joel preached it. Peter preached it. Paul preached it. And listen, the Holy Spirit right now is speaking to you today. He's speaking to you today through his living word with these same words. Call on the name of the Lord Jesus and be saved. And the offer of God stands for all who breathe his air and walk his earth and hear these words. No one who calls on the name of Jesus Christ will be disappointed, put to shame, lost, judged, but all who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. Calling on the name of Jesus is a fundamental description of a Christian. 1 Corinthians 1, 2 says this, to the church of God at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. What does it mean to become a Christian? (laughs) To come to the end of yourself, realize that you are the problem and to see Jesus as the only hope and his death in your place to actually cancel your debt. Call out to him and be saved. It's the greatest offer ever made. God freely offers salvation to sinners. There's a second truth we need to look at this morning about salvation through faith and it is that God uses means to save sinners. God uses means to save sinners. That is, God uses human implements, human words, hands, feet, messages. Look at verses 14 and 15. We just got done discovering that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. How will they call on him whom they have not believed? You understand the rhetorical question. They they can't. And how will they believe him whom they haven't heard? They can't. And how will they hear unless he is proclaimed? They can't. And how will they proclaim unless they are sent with a commission and a message as heralds? They can't. This four rhetorical question chain puts significant implications before you as a hearer of good news. It puts significant implications before you as a herald of good news. But we need to understand that what God is doing here is using means to accomplish his sovereign purposes. Listen, the, the, the hyper-Calvinists in Spurgeon's day that Spurgeon had to respond to folded their arms and said, well, if God is sovereign, he's going to save who he wants. The the people in William Carey's day who said, well, listen, if God wants to save the heathens out there in Papua New Guinea and every other place on the planet, 
then he'll do it. And he doesn't need us. What a tragedy. (laughs) They forgot the beautiful feet that brought them the gospel. And they forgot that the gospel must continue to go, that God uses means. If we unfold these means backwards, we discover six verbs. I'll just rehearse them for you. God sends proclaimers of the gospel. Proclaimers proclaim the gospel. Hearers hear the gospel. Hearers believe Jesus. Believers call on Jesus in faith. And everyone who calls is saved. That's the progress here. This is the normal means of God saving sinners. God uses means. Hey, listen, they are sent, (laughs) these proclaimers. Verse 15, they're sent with a commission. This is where we get our word apostle. They are apostled out. (laughs) There are capital A apostles, like Paul, the one untimely born, and, and the 11, the 12 minus the one plus the one. And then there's the lowercase apostling, the sending out with a commission. That is, this is God's ordained plan of sending out people with a task. And this is the great commission, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, where all believers are to be disciple-making disciples going out to the ends of the earth, preaching this good news to everything that moves. And this is the means by which God saves sinners. And they preach, verse 15. And, and, and to preach as a herald means you're preaching with a commission, you're preaching with the authority of the one who sent and the message of the one who sent you. It's not your message, right? There's a warning for us. You, you don't adulterate the message. You don't mix up the message. You get it right. We're gonna find out in verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by a word of Christ. It is the content about Jesus Christ that must be clearly proclaimed. We are heralds of another's message with the authority of that one who sent us. And notice in verse 14, hearers hear. But what do they hear? Paul does not talk about content. He talks about a person whom they have not heard. How will they believe the person that they haven't heard? And and the grammar makes it very clear that he's talking about people hearing Jesus, not hearing about Jesus, not hearing the good news of Jesus, but specifically hearing Jesus. It's unmistakable in Paul's text. That is when God's commissioned messengers go out as heralds with a message about Christ, with the gospel, what is it that hearers hear? Whom is it that hears here? They hear Christ. Listen, there is a close association between the New Testament apostolic message and Jesus himself. Jesus promised the disciples in the upper room, I'll tell you what to say. The Holy Spirit will come after I'm gone and tell you what to say so that you don't get the message wrong. The New Testament is red-lettered, right? If you've got a Bible with the words of Jesus in red, that's misleading, The New Testament is in red. This is the message of Christ. It's not just about the things he taught, but it is the message of who he is and what he accomplished for sinners that must be believed. And it is the person of Jesus Christ that our lives must be surrendered to, entrusted to. You trust him and you are saved. This chain of events laid out by Paul in four rhetorical questions informs us about man's responsibility with the gospel as hearers first and then as heralds. First, think about your responsibility as a hearer. God has sent someone to proclaim the gospel to you. You heard the gospel this morning from Josh Kelso. You're hearing it now in this very message and you are responsible to believe the gospel. You are responsible before God to believe the gospel and you will be held accountable for having heard it. You are responsible to call on Jesus in faith. Then and only then can you be saved. Listen, I've met people who have blamed God for their unbelief, for their unrepentance, for their lack of coming to faith in Christ. Listen, this is on you, hearer. You must believe The second, this chain of rhetorical questions informs our responsibility as heralds. You have heard the gospel, you've believed the gospel, you've called out in faith to Jesus Christ, you have been saved, and now you are an ambassador 
as Paul describes his own ministry in 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21. We are ambassadors for God, speaking on his behalf, as though God were making appeal through us. We beg you, be reconciled to God. That is the task of the Christian. That is the task Jesus commissioned the disciples to make disciple making disciples, which is us, to the ends of the earth until Jesus returns. This is the motivation for personal evangelism in your home, in your neighborhood, in your school, in your workplace. This is the motivation for missions to the ends of the earth, to the countless billions who do not yet know Christ, to the thousands and thousands of people groups, language groups who do not yet have the gospel published in their language or their vicinity. John Calvin said this, the gospel does not fall like rain from the clouds, but it is brought by the hands of men wherever it is sent from above. I think Calvin was a Calvinist, probably in the best sense of the word. And he believed in means for the accomplishment of God's purpose of salvation of sinners. God uses means to save sinners. God used means to save you, Christian. You were saved when by God's grace you called on Christ and you called out to Christ because you believed him and you believed him when you heard him and you heard Christ when someone proclaimed him to you. And how beautiful were the feet of those messengers. This beautiful feet phrase is a way to express gratitude for the messenger of the good news. Listen, feet in the ancient world were not beautiful. The idea here is even the feet were beautiful of the messenger of the gospel. This was precisely the argument that William Carey took up in his 1792 treatise, an inquiry into the obligations of Christians to use means for the conversion of the heathens. Carey believed in the sovereignty of God and salvation. But he believed that God used means to accomplish his purpose and that God would accomplish his purpose and that we must go to the nations. He rightly became referred to as the father of modern missions. He appealed to his countrymen in England, let's go. How can we stay here? And, and he argued against the arguments that were made. Well, don't you think there's enough people in England that aren't Christians yet, Mr. Carey? Yes, but they hear they have heard. And there are people all over this globe who have not heard. We must go. Carrie appealed to the reality of the age of exploration. In 1492, Christopher Columbus said, think about that, 1492. 14 centuries plus since Acts 1.8. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. How did the church fail to get to the ends of the earth? You say, well, transportation was a problem. Um, maybe. Think about this. In the early church history, it was said that the gospel, within a couple of centuries, broke down Hadrian's wall. The, the, the gospel went all the way to the, the, the pagan, heathen, island nation of England, Britain. And the gospel conquered the Britons that the mighty armies of the Roman Empire could not conquer. And the gospel did that very soon after the Great Commission. And the gospel went a lot of places conquering North Africa, even to India, and some say all the way to China. And yet Kerry makes the case that for a thousand years, the church lost the gospel and lost its impetus to take the gospel to the world and exchanged the idea of taking the gospel by proclamation of grace for the idea of taking Christendom to the world by force. And then people became Christians by the sword Christians. And what a tragedy, Carrie said. Listen, if, if, if Christendom with a false gospel could go to the ends of the earth, why can't we with the pure gospel of Jesus Christ go to the ends of the earth? And he went on to talk about the age of exploration. Listen, we send ships 
to get spices. You realize that a, a box of pepper, a small box of pepper, tracked from the Dutch East Indies, was worth sending a navy out to protect a ship from pirates from sinking that ship so the box of pepper would not be lost. And you think, pepper? What are you talking about? I have that on my table every night at dinner. I guess English food was pretty bad. <laughs> and William Carey makes the point that if we're willing to go to the ends of the earth for pepper and, and, and put all the resources into it that, that, that go into that and, and spend a nation's fortune on building a navy to get there, we go there for dollars. Can we not go there for souls? And his impassioned plea sparked a missionary enterprise to do just that. Think of it. Had the church been faithful for 1,600 years, <laughs> would we have sent the Dodds and the Cans and the Laymans and the Mitchells and Amelia to Papua New Guinea? We should have been there already. William Carey's plea stands. Can he writes, can we as men or as Christians hear that a great part of our fellow creatures whose souls are as immortal as ours and who are as capable as ourselves of adorning the gospel and in contributing by their preachings, writings, and practices to the glory of our Redeemer's name and the good of his church that they are enveloped in ignorance and barbarism, can we hear that they are without the gospel and not exert ourselves? And he went on to put his own life where his mouth was, spending his life in India and Bangladesh. I had friends in Nashville who were fifth generation. Oh, no, no, that couldn't have been right. They're, they're, they, no, they were fifth generation believers from India that had moved to Nashville. But they traced their heritage of hearing the gospel all the way back to William Carey's ministry. You know, it's not enough for us to say as believers at Grace Bible Church, our church does that. We publish the gospel in about as far away as you can get. It's not enough. There are still 53 language groups in the Finister Mountains of Papua New Guinea that need the gospel. And, and there are people all around you that need the gospel. And there are peoples all around us that need the gospel. This, this implicates us as heralds of the gospel. We must be proclaimers. It's the only way that people get saved. Paul quotes here, Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. I want you to turn to Isaiah 52. In these texts, all of these texts that Paul quotes here in this section refer to Jerusalem as Zion. And you know that Zion is God's term of endearment. His, it's his affectionate word for Jerusalem. It's the word he uses to describe Jerusalem, not in terms of their rebellion or their sin or their high-handed idolatry or rejection of him. It's the word he uses of Jerusalem when he sets his love and affections on them for salvation, for redemption, for restoration. And, and in all of these passages that Paul quotes, that is the way that God refers to Jerusalem. In fact, in Isaiah 52, uh, look back at verse 5. He says, now therefore, what do I have here, declares Yahweh, seeing that my people have been taken away without cause. Again, Yahweh declares, those who rule over them howl, and my name is continually blasphemed all day long. God's name is blasphemed among Gentiles because of Israel's rebellion. Paul picks up that theme in Romans and says, look, Jews who rejected, rejected Christ, the Gentiles blaspheme God because of your behavior. Listen, Israel rejected God in their rebellion and unbelief. And yet in this same chapter, God makes a promise to Zion upon whom he sets his affections. And he says, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, verse seven, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. In verse 10, he goes on to say, in the sight of all the nations, all the ends of the earth will see this salvation. <laughs> 
He's not saying that all the ends of the earth will see salvation through the gospel. He's not talking about the, na- the gospel to the nations yet. He will. But here he's saying that all the world will see that God keeps his promises to Israel. And then look down at verse 13. Here the prophet Isaiah begins that fourth servant song where he's describing the the purpose and work of of Messiah. He's speaking about Jesus 700 years before Jesus came. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up, greatly exalted. Look at verse 15. He will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. In other words, when Messiah comes, he will sprinkle the nations. God is going to do a work to the islands and the coastlands and the ends of the earth and in Tempe, Arizona. God is going to do that, and he's going to do it through Messiah. And Paul's quote of beautiful feet on the mountainside announcing good news is a quote of Isaiah's prophecy about what is yet to come for Israel, a restoration to the land in the millennial kingdom that comes from God coming to the earth and judging, setting up that kingdom, and rescuing Israel, keeping his promises to her. He's going to unfold that through the rest of Romans 11. And, and that work is going to come through the cross work of Jesus Christ, that servant of Isaiah 53 who pours out his life as a ransom for many. God's going to do this work. And Paul's quote of Isaiah 52 is an indictment against Israel's unbelief in the time of Messiah's coming. How ironic, he says, that the feet are beautiful that come with good news. That is, they come with God's endorsement. They come with God's commission and they proclaim good news and they were heard. Listen, the, the, the Jews in Jesus' day had Isaiah and did not believe it. I, I know we often look at this chain of rhetorical questions in Romans 10. How will they, how will they believe unless they've heard And we think about missions and we think about evangelism. And that's right because Paul universalizes this whole offer of the gospel in that and draws out implications for us as heralds. Absolutely true. But God is doing something else and and he's, or Paul is doing something else here as he's interweaving his roles as apostle to the Gentile and as a Jew who loves his countrymen and longs for their salvation. I want you to think about this chain of events. God sent preachers, verse 15, to whom? To Israel. And preachers proclaimed. They came with a commission and God's message and Israel didn't listen. They heard the preaching, but but that's where the chain fell apart for Israel. They they did not believe. And and not believing Jesus was Messiah, they they did not call out to him in faith. And not calling out to him in faith, they were not saved. They who were God's people are separated from God because of their response to the good news that came through them. That is exactly where Paul goes in the rest of chapter 10. Look at verse 18. But I say, surely Israel's never heard, have they? Indeed they have. (laughs) The people in Papua New Guinea haven't heard. Go proclaim. But the other implication for Paul in this text is, Israel, you have heard and you haven't believed. And the chain is broken and Paul's heart is broken over it. This leads to the third truth we need to see this morning in the last minute that remains about salvation through faith. You're responsible Man is responsible to respond in faith. Here in verse 16, the good news meets resistance. Look what Paul says. However, they did not all heed the good news. They did not all heed. And then he quotes Isaiah 53.1, that servant song of Isaiah that uh, is the preamble to that entire glorious song about Jesus dying on the cross. And it begins... Who has believed our report? Rhetorical question, nobody. And what was true in Isaiah's day is true in Jesus' day as the Jews rejected Messiah. They didn't believe Isaiah's report about Christ 
And it's true of the predominance of Israel in our day. They have not believed Isaiah's report about Christ. It will not always be true. Zechariah 12, 10, there's a day when they will look on him whom they've pierced, Yahweh whom they've pierced, and mourn for him as for an only son. And they will mourn with repentance and weeping and turning to Christ because the spirit of grace and supplication is poured out upon them. It's a promise in Zechariah. In fact, I believe what others have said about Isaiah 53, it is actually the song that Israel was, will sing in their repentance during the great tribulation leading into the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ when they look back on the one that they pierced. And they will say, who believed our report? But we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, and yet he came to justify, crushed by his father. They will sing that with weeping and repentance and joy when they finally believe the gospel. That's where Romans 9 to 11 is headed, Romans eleven twenty six, 26. All Israel will be saved. It's a future reality. And what you need to know this morning is that as Israel, every individual Jew has the personal responsibility to believe the gospel and to call on Jesus Christ. You sitting here today, each individual have the responsibility to embrace this universal invitation to have eternal life in Jesus Christ. You must believe. You must cry out to Christ. And verse 17 tells us a little bit more about that. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by a word about Christ. And Paul draws out the implication of verse 16 that the message was heard but not believed. <laughs> That's going to link us to verse 18 next week. But verse 17 is this unchanging content of the gospel that must be heard and embraced. It must be believed. And there's no other way, there's no other content than the content of the person and work of Jesus Christ in his death on the cross in the place of sinners. You must fully embrace that and entrust yourself to that completely. You cannot go to heaven by having some spiritual experience, by having a warm feeling at the top of a mountain at a sunrise or some emotional high. Faith is our responsibility to respond by entrusting our lives to the lordship and the love of Jesus Christ in the gospel, believing that his death was sufficient to pay for our sins. And while it's true that our that, that faith is a response to the message. It's also true that the message itself awakens faith. And if you've heard that message this morning, and even now are placing your faith in Jesus Christ, call out to him and you will be saved. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, what will we do with this greatest offer of all time? We pray that some even here today would respond in faith. And we beg, O oh God, that we would be eager heralds of that news. In our homes, are there people that must hear? They must hear a word about Christ. It must be proclaimed and heard and he must be believed and called upon. Are there people in our extended families that must hear? Are there people in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods that must hear? Are there are entire populations and language groups and nations of people who don't even have access to the gospel published yet, and they must. Oh God, would you raise up people from this body and send them? And God, would you be pleased? with us in our own worship of you, that your kindness and your love in the gospel for us. Here we are. Send us.